Hi, it's Rich from Planet PE, and we are back with our latest podcast. So we are now moving on to A3, uh, which primarily looks at the joints of the body. So there's a few things that we need to uh, iron out before we really begin, uh, and that is how we try and look at what a jo uh, joint is, and also trying to look at the different types of joints that we have in the body. So maybe at GCCPE or Level 2 BTEC, you only need to know uh, about our synovial joints, so the ones that we can move ourselves. Uh, at BTEC Level 3, we need to notice that a little bit more. So we're going to start then with being able to define what a joint is. So uh, the easiest way is to think about a joint as just being a place where two or mo more uh, bones meet. So it's quite simply where well, we've got a point where two bones meet is what we're going to call our joints. Uh, without these joints, uh, our body isn't going to be able to produce any movement, um, but not all joints actually produce movements. Uh, so there's actually several types of joints, and all of them have different amounts of movement uh, or different functions that they have. So, first of all, if we looked at classifying um, our joints into three particular um, classifications, we look at them as being fibrous. Uh, cartilaginous or synovial. So if we look at the fibrous one to start off with. So these fibrous joints are fixed and they don't allow any movement. And we're going to find these uh, in areas such as the cranium. So your skull isn't just one big solid bone mass, it's lots of plates, uh, a bit like the, the world, the tectonic plates um, that we have uh, that are joined together. So um, there are joints in your skull. Now we don't want those to move because it would be pretty dangerous if that happened. So we've got these fibrous joints that don't move. We've then got these cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous, quite a, quite a tough word to say. Um, and these are slightly movable. So we're going to find these uh, in areas such as in between our vertebrae, uh, where there's going to be a little bit of movement going on, but not lots and lots. And the third type, and these are the most um, important type for us, are our synovial joints. So these are freely movable joints that allow the most amount of movement or the greatest range of movement uh, and most of the joints in the body are what we call synovial joints okay now um, these synovial joints are freely movable so we can choose to move them we can um, choose when they move and when they don't move and they're the ones that we think about as more of our joints that as you would uh, use in a sporting example so uh, for a joint to be a synovial joint it's got a few um, characteristics of what make it a synovial joint so imagine we were um, putting our synovial joint on a on a dating website, for instance, and it would be able to say, "Well, this is all about me," and these are what we mean by the characteristics. So if we um, break up the structure of the synovial joint into smaller bits, and again, if you watch on YouTube, you'll see the pictures that should be able to help you. So to start off, if we look at the bursa, so there's one area of a synovial joint called the bursa, and this is an area that uh, reduces mechanical friction in the joint. It actually acts as a bit of a cushion. Um, so without the bursa, uh, there's going to be more friction in the joint, and therefore it won't move as easily. The next bit is a sign is what we call synovial fluid. So if you think about a car, a car has oil in it, and the oil there is to lubricate and stop the engine um, from all getting a little bit ground up and a bit mashed, really. So the synovial fluid lubricates and reduces friction. Um, it also helps to supply nutrients and remove waste products. So that key thing there is about reducing friction again. So the fact we've got this lubricant, which is called synovial fluid, uh, it means that as you exercise, you actually create more of this. So, so um, the structure of the synovial joint actually changes or improves um, through exercise. So that lubrication and the reduce in friction uh, is really, really key. Um, and people who, um, for instance, don't create enough synovial fluid find it might get really dry joints and actually they start to rub together a little bit, um, which we don't really want. The third one is called articular cartilage. Now this is a shiny elastic material that reduces friction and absorbs shock. So if you are uh, jumping, then there's every chance your bones might be moving closer to each other as you land. Well this articular cartilage um, is what's going to stop the bones from actually coll uh, colliding or meeting uh, each other. So that reducing friction and the shock absorbing is what our cartilage does. Now articular um, is really simple just about where bones meet so where bones articulate it's where they meet so we have this bone cartilage which is called articular cartilage so it just stops um, stops the bones from from hitting each other um, so absorbing the shock and then reduces friction uh, the next part is the synovial membrane now this synovial membrane um, is really key because this is where synovial fluid um, secretes from so synovial fluid as I said earlier 
is uh, a lubricant that produces friction and the synovial membrane is what secretes your synovial fluid. Uh, the next part is the joint capsule. Okay, so imagine this is like a plastic bag basically. So this surrounds the synovial joint and it is attached to the outer layer of the bones uh, forming the joint. And this seals the joint and provides the stability. So it basically holds everything inside it. So that's the joint capsule. So as we then go through, um, we want to think about um, these types of joints and you know, obviously the three classifications and then what makes a synovial joint a synovial joint. Now, on top of that, we then can classify synovial joints into six different groups. Now, you might have known this at GCC. Um, if any of you have listened to the podcast that we've done before, uh, we've talked about synovial joints and the types of joints in the past. So, synovial joints are divided into six different groups, and they, um, they are categorized based on the amount of movement that each joint can do. So, if we start with what we call a condyloid joint, so a condylar joint allows movement in two planes and those planes are backwards and forwards and side to side so we've got two different planes there now a plane of motion is just the direction so if you've not done that at GCC a plane of movement just means direction so we're saying that a condylar joint can move forwards and backwards and side to side so if you take your wrist you can move your wrist forwards and backwards and you can move it side to side and it doesn't really do a lot else you might think that you can rotate your wrist but you're not really you're just moving it forwards and backwards and side to side so that is what a condyloid joint does the next one is a gliding joint now a gliding joint is a little bit more complicated it's slightly odd um, it allows bones to actually slide over one another so if you think about the bone the small bones in your wrists uh, and your feet so think about the carpals uh, for instance in the uh, hand as you make a fist for instance um, your bones start to slide over each other so a gliding joint is that these bones actually glide or slide over one another. The third type of synovial joint is called a saddle joint. Now this is quite similar to a condylar joint, however the surfaces um, are concave and convex. So one, uh, if you think about science, um, one is slightly dipped and the other one slightly oval, so they're, they're shaped a little bit like a, um, a rider on a saddle, that's why it's called a saddle joint. Now these are positioned uh, between the carpals and the metacarpals and the only place that you will find them are in the base of the thumb. Okay, So think about a um, tennis player, the fact they can grip a racket, well it's because of your saddle joint. So three more joints to go. So we've got the next type of synovial joint which is called a hinge joint. Now you would have known of a hinge at, um, at GCC or level 2 BTEC um, and this only allows flexion and extension. So we have these in the knee and the elbow. So if you think about a door, it can open and close or the angle can increase or decrease. That's all a hinge joint can do. The next one is a ball and socket joint. Again, another one uh, that you would have heard about at GCC. And the ball and socket has the greatest range of movement. Okay, so it can move the greatest range. So it can do flexion, extension, abduction, adduction and rotation and we find our ball and socket joints in the hip and the shoulder. So if I'm a cricketer for instance, I'm going to use the ball and socket joint uh, socket, socket joint even, um, to be able to then bowl the cricket ball because my arm can, um, can fully rotate um, so I can get the ball coming from behind me to then get more power into that um, bowl. The final one is the pivot joint. Now a pivot joint allows twisting and rotating and we have pivot joints in our neck. So if you think about the movements you can do with your neck, I'm doing it at the moment by the mic, you might see the sound changing um, because my neck can rotate or twist. So they are the types of synovial joints. So just that quick recap, we have uh, six synovial joints but then we have three classifications of joints in the body. Okay, So two different kind of classifications that you need to be aware of. So as ever, we like to think about uh, how we're going to get exam questions into uh, these topics. So in this one then, um, from last year's paper, uh, there was a picture of a cricket bowler. And, and the picture um, showed them in their uh, bowling action. So the cricket um, bowler, when they bowl, um, will get sideways on, try and bring that arm over to then uh, try and bowl at the stumps. So the question was, analyze how the structure and function of the shoulder joint allow the cricketer to bowl the ball well and that's worth six marks so 
These slightly long questions need a bit more thought about them, so about how you're going to plan them. So give it a go on your paper or put the comments underneath as we always say and give it a go and then we will try and go through the answers with you. So if we're going to analyse how the structure and function of the shoulder joint allow the cricketer to bowl the ball well, the first thing we've got to talk about is the type of joint. Well the shoulder is a ball and socket. Well that's really really key because a ball and socket joint has the biggest range of movement. We also have to talk about the structure. Well. The structure is quite simple. So think about where bones meet, creates a joint, so therefore we'll talk about articulation. So bones articulate to form the joint. The next thing you'd need to think about is the shape and structure, and we need to link that to the full range of movement. So because of the shape and structure of a ball and socket joint, we can have a full range of movement to create rotation and circumduction. So if I was a spin bowler, for instance, um, I need rotation to be able to complete the full rotation of the shoulder to be able to bowl the ball so it's legal and then I would use circumduction which might then um, help me to try and put some sort of rotation on the ball. Uh, we would then need to look at the function of the joint. So particularly here looking at leverage. So because the joint um, involves the humerus um, obviously I'm going to get more leverage therefore get more power into the bowl, I can bowl it faster, um, I, can, I can bowl it correctly um, within the legal uh, ramifications of cricket. Uh, I might also think about, you know, we've got blood cell um, production, so I'm going to have oxygen um, for me to be able to use, and also think about maybe something about protection, uh, maybe in the scapula as well. The fifth thing that you would need to think about here then is how it's going to link to the performance. Okay, so obviously with bowling, there's certain movements that are required, and if you're not able to do that, then it's going to be an illegal bowl. So think about problems that might. Um, come around if your range of movement was smaller so therefore it may be someone maybe start to use their elbow which would make it a throw and therefore an illegal delivery okay so these six mark questions are much more difficult um, but just go back again and just listen to what we've just discussed there so five key points that we could add in to our uh, to our question to try and get six marks now the six marks come in different ways and different levels but your teachers I'm sure will go through that with you so once again, thanks for listening. Um, please like and subscribe uh, to the channel. And again, fo uh, follow us on Twitter at planet underscore PE uh, if you would like us to put anything else in there that maybe we're missing out. So thanks for listening, and we will see you again really soon.